So welcome to all things grants and residency. I'm gonna talk through everything from the search to developing your ideas to the submit. I'm Lisa Kramer and I'm RISD's grants and residency manager. And yep, that is me. I do like cats. Um, I also like art, but I'm not a trained artist. You are surrounded by talented artists, so you don't need me for that. What I have is a lot of grant writing experience and can offer another voice. I'm here to help you with all aspects of the grant application, no matter your discipline or project idea. I work to help you look at your proposals and applications in a different way, which can be particularly helpful if you are applying for grants in which you have to make your case to a variety of audiences, to a non-art specific audience. In addition, there's an entire team at RISD Careers here to help. We are happy to meet with you through individual or drop-in appointments about grants, residencies, internships, or jobs. So what is a grant? The definition is quite simple, agree to give or allow. So a grant could be called a grant, a scholarship, a fellowship, an award, and sometimes these user words are used interchangeably, but usually, a grant is funding for a specific project which supports the funder's mission and interests. A scholarship is usually an award for past work to continue academic-based work. A fellowship usually has some sort of service commitment such as teaching or an internship. An award can really be any of these. Don't let the word grant scare you. It really is an umbrella word for opportunity and it's really not that complicated. It's about finding a good match for like interests. The organization, the grantor has an interest, the mission, and they have the money. They seek out people, grantees with skills and experience to help promote, enhance, and engage in their mission. Sometimes you'll see this called an RFP, which just means request for proposal. You, the grantee, make the case for why you and why your project in some sort of application. They decide who and what they want to support, the award, and you, the grantee, fulfill the grant purpose and document the activities and results. A grant is an opportunity for focused time, studio space and project funding to work, study, explore, research, implement an idea, travel or network. And it's for all levels from first years to graduate students from emerging to established artists. Of the 400 plus grants I've written, each one was very different. Some took a day, some a few weeks, some many months. Each funder has unique interests, eligibility requirements and processes. But developing a proposal has a number of steps in common, search, research, plan, develop, write, submit, wait, and learn. So let's start with the search. The best place to start is with the RISD Careers website. You will find all things grants and residency here. I'm not gonna go review everything in detail, but I will touch on some of the highlights to get you started. Always start closest to home. So first let's look at the RISD Careers Manage Grant page. These managed grants are grants RISD Careers has some connection to. The funding might come from RISD or is matched by RISD. RISD might nominate candidates or RISD provides support through the application process. I'm gonna run through them quickly to give you a sense of what's out there, but do know that detailed information on each one of these awards is found on the RISD Careers Managed Grant page. First, we will start with the biggie, the RISD Maharam Fellowship. $5,000 for an unpaid summer internship in an organization where artists and designers are not usually found. This is not a last minute grant. You have to design your internship experience, develop the internship relationship, and there are a number of essay questions. Keep in mind, you can apply for this grant the February of the year you are graduating for an internship that will take place the summer after you graduate. RISD Careers offer, also offers smaller grants to support internships. $1,000 to $3,000 grants for enrolled students that support internships that are unpaid, low paid, or present financial challenges. RISD Career par Careers partners with residencies to combine funding to offer opportunities for time and space for your work at Anderson Ranch in Colorado, Monson Arts in Maine, Oxbow in Michigan, and Skohegan in Maine. We also manage project grants for the St. Boltoff Emerging Artist Award an unrestricted $3,000 award for emerging New England artists, and the Wingate Lamar Fellowship, an incredible flexible opportunity for seniors and fifth year students who work in craft, $15,000. Keep in mind, the grants I've mentioned are grants managed by RISD Careers. There are other grants and awards offered by other departments at RISD. We've included a few of these on our managed grant page. Do stay on top of what's going on in your department. Then there is Fulbright, my favorite managed grant. 
However, I won't go into a lot of detail as this is a presentation of its own. So just a little bit about Fulbright. Fulbright is a primarily a cross-cultural engagement opportunity for fully funded nine to 12 month independent study research projects in 140 plus countries. You design your own projects and develop host country affiliations. It is a complicated grant with lots of moving parts and know that you can apply through RISD up to three years after graduation. RISD is a top producing Fulbright institution in the specialized institution category with 91 RISD awardees to 42 different countries. On our webpage, you will find two important documents to help you through the process, RISD's checklist and deadlines and RISD's getting started. We will also offer a RISD Fulbright info session in March. Keep in mind, if you are applying through RISD, you have to meet our internal deadlines. This is an intense process. We are here to help, but we do have to keep all our applicants on track. We often say that once you apply for a Fulbright, all of their grants are easy. Also, when looking for inspiration, go to our RISD Fulbright alumni website. You will find project summaries, stories, and photos to get you motivated. Moving on beyond RISD, there are numerous grant resources with search databases, which is great, but it can be overwhelming. They tend to serve you best when you have that project in mind and know what you need. Consider some keywords and then just jump in, start poking around and see where the search takes you. I'm gonna review four key resources to get you started. The New York Foundation for the Arts, NYFA, is excellent for the arts. Know that it is not limited to New York City or to New York State. Start your search by going to awards where you can enter specific criteria to narrow or broaden your search. For example, in this search, I filtered cash award and photography, which resulted in 107 opportunities. You will find a brief description of each to help you narrow your search and then a link to their website. The Foundation Center includes all grants. It is not necessarily arts focused, which gives you a lot more to search through, but you may find that non-art specific organization where artists could make a difference. You could be a unique applicant that stands out. You do need a subscription to search this database. It is $19.95 a month. You can sign up for a month when you have some time, do a number of searches and then unsubscribe or you may be able to access it free through your public library. The third key resource is state arts agencies. Here you can find information on every state's art agency. Obviously the expectation is that these grants benefit the people of the state. So often a requirement is that you are a resident of the state for a certain number of years. You may be in transition now, but wherever you end up, remember to check and see what is going on in your state. For example, for my home state, Minnesota, the Minnesota State Arts Boards offers a number of grant opportunities for individual artists. You will find that most state art agencies will have a website with a grants page similar to this. RISD Careers has our own searchable database of opportunities. These are opportunities that our staff and peer advisors have found to be of particular interest to RISD students and alumni. For example, if you search on film, animation, and video, you will get 41 hits which you can narrow with additional keywords, review the basic description, and then move on to the funder's website. These databases and lists are all great, but there is no magic bullet. You have to make the search your own. Your grant and residency search is unique to you. So in your search, in addition to these online resources, get creative. Ask your professors, where have they found funding for projects? Where have their students? Faculty are often the best source of discipline specific grants. Ask your classmates, peers, other artists and designers, what did they find? What actually worked for them? Hearing from others like you will make it real and show you it is possible. Find and review the resumes of artists you are interested in and admire. Search for their website and find their resume and see what awards they have received. Build a library of opportunities for now and later. Once this is on your mind, you will start hearing about opportunities and there will be some you aren't eligible for right now and some you'll find that you just missed the deadline. So keep track of the ones you want to research, the ones you want to apply for now, maybe the ones for next year, and the ones you don't want to forget about in the future when you are ready. For example, this is just a quick, simple Excel spreadsheet. You could have tabs for time, now, after graduation, 10 years from now, and or you could have tabs by type of grant or residency. Note that I'm not organizing by due date, but rather when I want to start working on the grant. If the grant is due in February, starting in February isn't likely gonna help you. Factor in plenty of lead time. This slide is specifically for international students. You know more than anyone how challenging it is to find funding for education or projects outside your home country. It is true that most funders in the US focus on US citizens, 
but not all, and especially residencies are open to international students. Do ask around and ask. Ask the financial aid office at any school you are going to or planning to go to. Ask your college departments like the Career Center and know that the grants RISD funds are open to international students. Ask organizations you and your family members are connected to. Search the online databases like the Foundation Center. Google search on grants for international students and you will get lists of ideas. And if the citizenship eligibility is not clear, don't hesitate to email and ask. Find out that out right away. Let's talk about residencies. Residencies like grants are also individually unique. They could be for an enrolled student, emerging artist, or a mid-career artist. They could be totally open for you to work. They could come with a work component. They could be theme-based, asking you to explore a specific issue. They can be found all over the world, on islands, in the mountains, on farms, and on ships. Only 25% of US residencies are fee-based. That means if you are accepted, only 25% ask, ask you to pay a fee. Most are merit-based and offer grants to pay residency fees or some sort of work exchange. Some may even provide a stipend for supplies. Start your search here, again, at the RISD Careers website under Artist Resources. You'll find all things residency here, including our top search sites. The Artist Communities Alliance, the ACA, is by far the best way to start, as this is an association of residencies who have met certain standards. On the Residencies tab, you will find the search function Go to the left side column. Here you can enter your criteria and start your search. You likely know the biggies, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown or Penland in North Carolina, but here you might find some of the smaller, lesser known, super interesting residencies, such as this residency is literally in the woods along the Mississippi River near New Orleans. This one is in our own backyard, a studio in Providence for artists, printmakers, and writers. The Sanford Underground Research Facility is, you guessed it, underground, a mile underground in the Black Hills, South Dakota. This one is theme-based residency at Santa Fe Art Institute in New Mexico. The 2022 theme is revolution. The 2023 theme is changing climate. There are residencies in our national parks from Hawaii to the Grand Canyon, where you might work alongside staff and advance your practice while being immersed in amazing nature. And there are international opportunities. Here's one in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Here's one in an old high school in Japan. And here's a theme-based residency in Finland. Keep in mind that international residencies can be expensive considering that you will most likely also have to pay airfare. Do ask about financial support if it is not easily found on their website. Sometimes they may have support, but just not advertise it. If you haven't, be sure to sign up to receive the ACA newsletter. You'll receive a notice of opportunities and links to residency news, articles, and advice. Also, on the same tips page, I want to point out a very helpful worksheet. Go to Tips for Artists and then Fund. You will find an Excel worksheet that walks you through developing a residency budget, which you can download and make your own. It will help you think through your financial needs, not only for a residency, but a project grant maybe, or even setting up a studio. Lastly, on residencies, you will find great application tips on the RISD Careers Artist Resource page. Do consider that grants and residencies have deadlines and are often on annual cycles. If you need project money quickly, consider crowdsource funding. RISD has a Kickstarter page with over 6 million in funded projects. If you go this route, be sure to contact RISD Careers to get connected to this page. Sometimes generous donors are out there looking to fund projects and they might start with RISD. Most of you are probably familiar with crowdsource funding for products or for community projects where the audience, benefits, and outcomes are clear. But there are also successful funding campaigns for smaller, more individual projects or experiences like residencies. Here are three successful campaigns for residency funding. The second step is research. Once you find an opportunity, research it carefully. The application could be quite simple, six images of your work and a brief statement. Residency applications are often based entirely on your work but they might include some narrative to get to know you and, and to help them narrow their pool of applicants. Or the application could be quite complicated with many application pieces like Fulbright or really any government grant. I'm gonna use the RISD Maharam Fellowship as an example, which again is found on our RISD Managed Grants webpage. First, 
know the deadline and that most do not make exceptions. Most grants are on annual cycles. If you miss the deadline, make note for next year and keep checking. Things keep changing from year to year, opportunities and due dates. Review the eligibility requirements. Most guidelines will be quite specific. Is it for enrolled students or alumni? Is it discipline specific? Do you have to live in a certain city or state? Does the project have to benefit a certain community? If you find you are not eligible now, make note of the grant for the future. Understand the grantor's interest. Pull out keywords from the website and guidelines. For Maharam, those might be non-art and design learning and skills gain, work outside of comfort zone, solve problems, voice and work. Consider and address these key points in your proposal. In fact, write them at the top of your working document so you're sure to hit these points. Know your audience. What is important to them? Who do they want to benefit? And who will be reviewing your application? Whether it's artists or community members will make a big difference. Learn from past grant recipients. Find out who they are. What was their background? What were their projects? Usually you can find information on past grantees on the organization website. You may even be able to reach out to them for advice. We find that past grantees are grateful for the opportunity they received and are happy to talk with applicants. Understand all the application components well in advance. Let's look at detail at some of the possible application components. The application form. I mentioned this first because this often is, but it should not be last minute. Know what the fields are and know what you'll need. Don't let the easy stuff trip you up at the end. There is usually some sort of narrative required. It could be a proposal, artist statement, personal statement, or essays. It could have few limitations or have very specific questions. And check the space limits. It makes a big difference if the count is by words or by characters. Timeline. If they request a timeline, it most likely does not have to be specific day to day or even week by week, but rather in the first months or in the first quarter of the grant. This is where you can prove that your project is feasible. This is where readers can see how your project could happen. Be as detailed as reasonably possible, but you also want to show that you're not too rigid. Find a balance between showing a plan, yet also openness and flexibility. Recommendation letters. Reach out to your recommenders early and give them a timeline. Provide a summary of the opportunity and of your proposal. Maybe even give them a template to work with. Consider who will provide the most meaningful support and make the right connections. And consider who will be timely. A RISD Fulbright applicant worked for months on their application. They submitted on time. Their third recommender did not. They were not considered for Fulbright as their application was not complete by the due date. Also, don't forget to thank your recommenders and update them along the way. Resume. You may have this all ready to go, but you might need to tailor it to the grantor and the project. Know that RISD Careers has advisors who can help with resumes. Transcripts. Find out what the process is to receive your transcripts early. It could be a mail process. And check and see if they are asking for unofficial or official transcripts. Unofficial transcripts can pass through your hands and be uploaded by you. Official transcripts must be sent by the school to the organization directly. Know that the scanning and adjusting process may take longer than you think due to watermarks and security on the transcript file. Once uploaded, your transcript should be neat and legible. You are visual artists. Visual materials. This may be the most important piece of the proposal, but it is at the end of my list because this is what RISD students do well. But just a few quick tips. Follow the instructions. How many, size, and resolution. Make your case with effective, high quality images. Consider every image counts. Every image should tell a story that supports your purpose and path. You can have some detail shots, maybe an installation shot, but no throwaways. Make the connection to your grant project through your images. This may not be the time to submit your gallery ready portfolio. Focus on the fit to your project. Check to see if you can submit image descriptions. If so, use this space. Not only title, size, and materials, tell us more. This is your chance to write about your work. Take advantage of this space. Curate the order thoughtfully for a cohesive portfolio feel. A curated portfolio shows organized thinking and thoughtfulness. It shows you care about this opportunity. Be sure to start strong to capture their attention and make them want to see more. Be sure to end strong as that last image will stay in their mind as they move to other parts of your application. And in a group review, that last image may stay up on the screen as they talk about your application. You want that image to be strong and connected to what you are proposing. 
And a final tip, print each image you are considering on half sheets of paper and tape them to a wall. Stand back and really look at them and then move them around to find that compelling flow. In developing a budget, ask for what you need, not more or less. Reviewers are often experts and they will know if it's over or under. They want to know in a sense that they are getting the most bang for their buck, but also that it is adequate because they want you to be successful. Here is a template that I made up. If you can choose the format, show your budget in a neat Excel spreadsheet or a table. Show that you are a professional. Show off your visual skills and ways of thinking. Show detailed descriptions where possible. Make sure the amounts add up and make sure it matches the grant amount. Here's another template. If you have the opportunity to show what the full project will cost, add a column to show other funding. This will show your resourcefulness, that your project is on your way, and that they aren't the only ones invested. Think of an application and the many components like a puzzle. There are many pieces that have to come together in just the right way at just the right time. Thoughtful organization is an important part of the grant writing process. I love this photo. This is a photo of RISD Architecture alum Ming Wong's workspace as she was developing a grant for a project in Denmark and Greenland. It highlights the importance of clever organization of all the puzzle pieces, which brings us to plan. Dedicate time to the process. Set internal deadlines that are earlier than the funders so you have no problem meeting their deadlines. Factor in time for support documents that are not in your control, like recommendations, letters of support, and transcripts. Build an archive of responses. Starting with a blank page can be overwhelming. Develop a way to keep track of your applications and essays so you can find and reuse material you have developed. Again, a simple Excel spreadsheet. Here I've listed the grants I've applied to along with keywords that I can then search on. So the grant comes up where I wanna highlight my language skills, I can search on keywords, find the grant application I submitted in which I addressed my language skills, then go to the application document that I've saved, copy, paste, and revise as, revise as needed for the new grant I'm applying for. Moving on to develop. Grants are primarily about your exploration and there are so many things you want to explore, right? That's excellent, be open, think big. But then you are gonna have to narrow and focus. Think less is more, especially considering the limited space you have to do it justice. To stand out in a competitive applicant pool to reviewers who are very busy, you need to keep focused on a single topic. It is better to explore one idea and explain it effectively rather than introduce many ideas poorly. Make your activities and goals feasible. Consider your timeline and your funding carefully. Even if you think or even know it's possible, you don't want your reviewers to feel overwhelmed and question your ambition. A lot of activities, locations, players involved, or goals may not sound feasible. What are the three things you want reviewers to remember? Three, that's it. Study shows that humans really only remember three things. I know even from this presentation, you will likely only take away three things. Write the three things you really want to stand out in your application at the top of your working document and make sure they jump out. Make a case for why this specific grant or residency. Of course, everyone knows you are applying for different things. You don't put all of your eggs in one basket, but if this could be any grant or any residency or location or applicant, it's not so interesting. Make your unique case. This may seem confining, uncomfortable. There is so much you want to do and say, but know that your experience will be broader, deeper, and go in directions you didn't expect. So how do you do this? How do you focus and formulate your ideas into a written proposal? It will happen through a process and with time, by tailoring to the grantor's mission, interests, and guidelines, through your project research, by working with a professor, a mentor, a grant recipient peer, a RISD career advisor, or the RISD Center for Arts and Language, and through lots of writing and brainstorming. In developing your project and proposal, you will need to hit what I call the W's plus. Who, what, where, why, when, and the pluses, how, how do you know, and so what. We have a resource to help you through this process. If you go back to the RISD Careers website under grants and awards, at the bottom, you'll find a link to proposal development considerations. This document may help you think through your answers to the W plus questions. It is in a sense, a way to interview yourself. You can use these prompts as headers in your draft to help you focus and then delete later. 
I'm not going to review each prompt. You can review this on your own as you consider you, your unique projects and interests, but I will hit on a few key points. What is your learning objective? Clearly articulate what it is you want to learn and how you will learn it through this opportunity. What is the context? Don't assume they know. Explain the process or materials or history, especially if the reviewers are not artists. For example, if your proposal is about Mongolian gears, a textile dwelling, you first have to explain what it is. Maybe provide some history, its current role, and the pros and cons. And likely, you'll need to do this in a very short space, which is one reason why focusing on one thing that you can explain well is so important. Who cares? What makes this relevant? Why is this important to you, the funder, the community, maybe even society? For example, if you are interested in Italian puppets, great. But how do you get others on board? How do you speak to what is important to the grantor? Perhaps by talking about why it is important that this specific art form continues to exist. Perhaps by considering that a traditional art form may actually have an even more important role in our contemporary technology focused world. What is the connection? Why is it a good fit for their mission? Refer back to their wording. Make the connections for them. Don't make them guess or read between the lines. Why you? Show your path. Demonstrate that you've done your research and you were prepared, that you have the skills and experience to do this, but also show there's room to grow and learn. If you are already there and you know everything, then why fund you? Show how this grant will move you forward. What is the impact? This is the so what. What difference will this grant make to you, the organization, the community? Usually they want to understand the impact in the short term, but you could include intentions or contributions for the long term without seeming too grant. You might find that most of your questions about applying for a grant are answered with, it depends. That's because your proposal is unique to you, your ideas, your project, your art and design, and to all those involved. Now for many, the scariest step, writing. Applying will usually involve some writing. It may be one 250 word essay, it might be 15 250 word essays, or it might be a complicated project you have to describe in only two pages and every word counts. For the most part, grant writing is not so much about being creative, it's about being straightforward and authentic. Here are some basic writing tips. Concise, yet compelling and with passion. Professional, yet in your own voice. Grantors are not interested in overly edited writing. They wanna hear from you. Get there faster. Don't wait until the end to tell us your goals. Those first two paragraphs are the most important. Show, don't tell. Don't write, I'm a leader, I was president of X Club. Tell us how you led, give us an example, tell us a story. Be accurate in spelling, grammar, and facts. Pay attention to the required formatting. You want a neat application package from beginning to end. You never want to annoy your reviewers with little things like typos or incorrect formatting. Clear and jargon free, know your audience. Don't use RISD lingo, even be careful of discipline lingo. Again, consider that reviewers may not be artists and designers. Consider this statement. I will analyze the vernacular of the built environment and corresponding visual hierarchy by investigating urban junctures, material patterns, and contextual holes comparing evolving typologies in order to identify the infrastructural outcomes and development responses to architectural vacancies that could affect the manifestation of facial relationships and dynamics and social practices and interactions while adapting for contemporary and historical perspectives. So I actually wrote this to make a point, but do consider what you write may make sense to you, maybe even make sense in the RISD world, but it might not make sense in the outside world. You have to be more specific and you can't rely on discipline lingo to make your point. Here is a focus, specific statement of purpose from a successful RISD Fulbright applicant. To get there, I suggest write out a simple overview statement, the W's at the top of your document and refer back to it. Consider every sentence counts. Why are you telling us this? Does it support your overview statement? Ask someone to read your work and then tell you what they think you are proposing. Does it match? Check your ending for important statements that should be at the beginning. This speaks to the get there faster. Remember, you can't proofread your work very well and list others, ideally more than one, and ideally inside and outside your discipline. Word of warning though, try to get feedback early on in your process. Getting additional feedback at the end could throw you off. At the beginning, talk to lots of people and consider everyone's advice, but then make it your own. This is your proposal, your voice. 
Don't forget RISD Center for Arts and Language, an excellent resource for brainstorming or fine tuning your proposal. And then it's time to submit. Set time aside for this process. Don't be rushed. Print and proof a hard copy with a red pen. It is always a good idea to print and review. Looking at your work in a different way off a computer is the best way to catch errors. Have all your documents ready. Do not submit on the due date. Seriously, so many things can go wrong at the last minute. Granters are dealing with way more applications than they can award. For example, Fulbright receives 10,000 plus applications for 2,000 awards. They will not make exceptions. Many grantors will actually warn you in the application to not submit on their due date and that they are not responsible for technical difficulties. Set an internal deadline to submit and stick to it. And then you wait. The wait can be fairly short or a really long time. Most take one to three months. The Fulbright wait is about seven months. It is a test of patience. In the meantime, move on and apply for other things. Whether you receive the award or not, you will learn a great deal. Grant development is a character and skill building experience. You will learn from the process. You will learn from your mistakes, which you will make. I've made them all. You will learn about yourself and more about what you wanna do or what you don't wanna do, equally important. And you will learn about other opportunities. The grant writing process itself may encourage you to leap to a lily pad you hadn't considered. Many alumni come back to us and tell us, you know, I didn't get that grant, but because of the work I did on that application, I applied and received this other grant or this job or made this new connection. Life is more like a pond of lily pads than it is a path. One jump leads to the other in various directions. A final few things to keep in mind. There is a lot of competition and only so many awards, but why not you? This is not free money. You do have to work for it. There are no special tricks or easy ways. Work through, not around. There are no have tos. This is not homework. This is something you want to do. Try, try again. Most grantors encourage you to reapply. And if they remember you, they will appreciate your motivation and commitment. It will not be a waste of time. Grant writing is a process. Be patient and ask for help, especially if you haven't done this before or if it is a complicated grant. You can learn by meeting with one of our advisors, watching for opportunities in the RISD Careers e-news, and attending RISD Careers presentations like this one. Now go and explore. Thank you, everyone. Um, one, um, if I'm applying for an opportunity and the amount of money isn't enough to cover everything that I wanna do for the project, how should I go about pursuing other grants? And then how do I inform the grant organizations that I'm applying for multiple ones? Great, um, various ways, to, it depends. Well, let's just say it depends. <laughs> um, but yeah, various ways to do this. And you don't want to show a funder that you need a lot of money and that then they might see this and think, well, we're only giving $3,000 grants. And so then this isn't gonna work. So you would want to, Usually in the application, there'll be a space where you can talk about where you are gathering other funding, whether it's from your own personal funds, whether you're applying for another grant, or you're going to be doing some crowdsource funding. Another way to do it is showing them how you could trim the project. So if I receive this much, I could do this. If I receive this much, I could do this. And if I got this grant, then I will, there's sort of a different stage. I'll add on to this. So you want to make sure that everything looks feasible. So if they give you this amount, you can do something with this money, but you can find places in the application where you can talk about what else you could do if you were to receive more. Okay. And Lisa, let me flip it because there are times when you know a project will cost so much and the grant money is actually more than you might need for the project, which I know it sounds hard to believe out there, but those things do happen. How do you approach the application when you know that your budget might be less than the total amount of money? Partly, you might want to think, I mean, it depends on how big of a difference you're talking about. I think if you are applying for a $5,000 grant and you really only need $1,000, then you're probably not going to be extremely competitive because your other applicants are going to need the money and that's going to be visible. So 
Um, so you might want to think about that. But if you are, if you're somewhat close, I probably wouldn't even worry about it. If you were it's a five thousand dollar grant and you're in the four thousand range, maybe maybe that's fine. Um, but other ways, there are ways to kind of really think about what else you need. I think a lot of times we talk to students and they aren't thinking of everything they need that you need to live during the summer. Even if you are living at home during the summer, there is contributions to your household, to food, to you know, thinking about all those things, your cell phone. Um, sometimes there's things to think about like, well, is there a sort of a side project I can add on a conference I can go to that would help me learn to you know, bolster this grant opportunity? Is there some place I could travel to, to talk to someone, to meet with an artist, to take an artist out, out to lunch? So are there ways to sort of get creative um, and, and having a bigger grant experience? Um, so again, I think the answer is it depends and get creative. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Great. So we do have a few questions that have come in in the meantime. So, um, so Deborah had asked earlier about um, RISD's crowdfunding, um, and was it available for CE students? Now, I, I just wanna, so Kevin, I'm just gonna put this out there. So I shared the link to our page where there's, it talks about crowdfunding in general. Um, could you just state like all those resources, and forgive me if I'm wrong, yeah. all those resources there are available to everybody right. out there in the world. It's just Deborah that there are certain sections that um, like if it was a RISD project, a degree um, um, seeking students project, it kind of gets roped into a RISD area of those places. But those crowd um, funding resources that we shared are available widely to everybody. Um, and so, Kevin, if you want to um, pump that up a little bit. Yeah, no, um, Alan, your, your response is exactly what we would want you know, um, any artist or designer to know that those sites that we've listed, we feel are reputable. We've heard, or um, not only we've heard good things, but um, RISD students alumni have used those sites often. Um, so that very specific RISD Kickstarter page um, was a special arrangement and partnership with Kickstarter where they created that again for our full-time students and alumni, but that does not limit any RISD person, including full-time students and alumni for from being on Kickstarter, they don't have to be on our page either. So the, all of those sites that Alan linked are available. Yeah. Super, thanks very much, Kevin. Yeah. So Lisa and Kevin, you may wanna hop in on this too. So the one of the questions is, are there any types of grants to avoid or be wary of when applying for um, an assortment of opportunities? So the first, I'll let you answer too, Ken. The first thing that comes to my head is we don't like it when we see grants that you have to pay for to apply for. That would be one of my big things. And sometimes there is a, is a small fee, especially residencies will have sort of a, a small fee, um, but we're talking definitely under 50 bucks. Um, so when we start to see that you're paying for an application process, then we get a little weary and we'd want to really look in and into it further and talk to somebody who's done it and what that means and what your chances are. Um, but beyond that, I think the research you do for each one and you can, it's all out there on the internet, you can talk to past applicants. Um, I can't think of any experiences that were really shady. Um, but again, the ones that ask you to pay to apply. Kevin, you have anything? Yeah, um, that is one of the red flags right away. If the amount of the application is really high, it can be um, even Skowhegan, I think, is in the $80 range now. Um, you know, for the final, minute. yeah, right. For the final <laughs> stage so so residencies are a different animal here. We're, yeah. we're talking grants was the question. But, well, I, I do want to merge the two because for another reason, um, you know, often with the grants, um, you're given the funding and then you have to meet the requirements of the project. Um, I think when issues of maybe greater personal safety and things to be wary of um, do come in a realm when you're going to a location and what is that um, organization providing you. So on the residency side, um, you know, you want to do a lot of careful research. And in my opinion, if there's anything you question, 
reach out to the organization and ask it. Try to get answers. And if you're not getting the answers you want, this includes grants as well. You know, if you, um, there's almost always uh, questions at, info at, or a person of contact. If an agency isn't giving you a proper response or the kind of answers that you feel make you comfortable, then that can be a red flag as well. But with residencies, do a lot of research, make sure about what you're getting into. And as Lisa noted, both um, with grants and with residencies, if you can Google people who have been awarded the opportunity, you can often either reach out to them or learn more about what their experience was like. So. Yeah, and just to say, most many organizations. This um, I know I can speak to residencies a little more, but a lot of the organizations will post who their own alumni are, who's been granted in the past, and they literally will link to their websites and and give you lots of information because they want you to know like about these wonderful people that they've that they've supported. Um, so moving to another question, this is a big question, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to send this one to Lisa. Um, and I'll, I'll head it off, I know it depends, but <laughs> Ariel asks, how do you report the money for tax purposes? And this got um, voted up as a question too, other people are interested there. This not only gets an it depends, this gets an I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, grant funding is taxable, it is considered income, unless it is going to tuition, books, educational fees directly. Um, but from there, not being your tax accountant and not being my own very beginning tax accountant, you really have to you know, look at your own taxes, where you fall, your status, all that stuff is incorporated into this. So we can't really give you tax advice. Um, you'll have to look there's. There's a website um, on the IRS that has like where scholarships and grants are. Um, I don't know if you can, I can even find that while Kevin's answering a little bit more and put it in the chat. Um, but you, it, it's a, I know taxes are complicated in the United States. They're really complicated. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one and kind of have to do a little research on it. And if I can, Kevin, before you hop in there, okay. I'm going to do like a little promotional opportunity here because literally this Thursday night, and I just put a link in the in the chat. Um, we're part of the Art of Business series. The next, um, the, the next webinar that's happening on Thursday is taxes for creatives and, and designers. So Hannah Cole will be presenting and um, speaks to this um, at great length. So if you want to go ahead and register for that event. Yeah, I would just, um, again, repeating a, a little bit bit of what Lisa said. Um, we know overall within the United States that your, your grant is, is taxable. Um, you should um, reach out to the organization providing you the grant and ask them what their reporting of your um, grant is to the IRS, because that can be very helpful for you to know how it's reported. Will you receive any forms um, for it? But um, the key thing, because um, we are not tax consultants in any way, is to know that your grant funding is taxable. I think that's the most important. Thank you both. Yeah. Um, so Alexander asks, if an alumni is developing a public art festival or international gallery project in Europe or seeks access to promote a call for submission, can RISD Careers help promote the initiative to the RISD community? So basically, if there's a call, a call for action, a call for submission, yeah. can we help promote that? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things we love to get are opportunities for um, artists and designers and fine artists. And our um, job board platform, Artworks, is a site when, where anybody um, can go in, including RISD alumni and non-RISD alumni and, and people outside of RISD and post these kind of opportunities. Um, Alan, if you, um, I think you're doing it probably right now. I am. If you can I include am. the link. You got um, it. Now, one thing for you to know, um, just due to the structure of job boards, um, you might see terminology that says you're making an employer profile. Um, our postings are free. 
So by employer profile, it means an organization profile or an individual submission, because we do take individual um, opportunities as well, including freelance. Um, we will though look at the every opportunity that comes in and to the best of our knowledge, make sure that it is appropriate and valid um, for you know, those who will see it. Um, and then we'll, we will post it if it um, passes that, so. And Kevin, thank you for saying, and I'd love to just amplify when you go to Artworks, even though you're an alum, register as an employer. Right. You, if you're looking for a job or you're looking for opportunities, you can register as an alum. That's one thing. Right. Um, students register as students. That's how they seek opportunities. Right. But if you're an employer, if you want to post an opportunity, you have to log in as an employer, even though there is the opportunity to log in as an alum. Okay. Yeah. So this, big distinction this would, there. Yeah. And just to say what Alan said, this has tripped up a lot of alumni, full uh, alumni of the full time program because they'll say, um, oh, yeah, I'm already in Artworks. And I'll be like, yes, you're in as an alum but you have to do this as an employer. So just further clarification. Yeah. And Lisa, did you have something there? Yeah, I was just gonna add too, you know, when you're doing things like this as alumni and you have a success or some stories that you wanna share that alumni relations has a, a form that you can fill out. Um, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll actually put that in the chat. I did put the tax thing in the chat and I'll put this in the, the chat um, that you might want to just get it into the alumni relations news. Great, thank you, Lisa. So um, we do have another question here that says, do review committees also review your websites, LinkedIn profiles, social media, even if that's not required on the application? It depends. <laughs> it depends. Well, well, it depends on the person. And I'll, <laughs> so I, I would say that um, sometimes they get, exact directions to say, do not look at other materials. But if you are given the materials and it, your LinkedIn profile is listed on your resume or your website is listed on your resume or all these things are listed on your resume, it's very possible that somebody will go and look at those items even though they're not required or part, technically part of the application. Uh, I, I think that can happen out of human nature, of course, but um, having been on a good number of selection committees, um, I guess I want to assure you that selection committees are see so many candidates and applicants, and um, there's an awful lot to review from the written proposal to the visual work that's submitted that um, committees hold really tightly to the, their requirements. So if you've met the requirements of specific imagery, um, what's required of the proposal, what questions you've answered or any other materials. Um, I think you can feel pretty confident that most committees are sticking to that as a comparison of one candidate to another. Um, and I and I personally have seen that held true on almost every committee I've been on. So um, I think that's good news. Um, but as Alan noted, if you see some really great work and a resume submitted and there's a web link, um, might you go to it and click on it or take a look? Um, possibly. So I, I, I would just add too. I will admit that I have done that. Having been on juries and grant panels, I have absolutely looked at it and I've I've been part of um, groups that have gone outside. So I say cover those areas. Like if you're gonna list it on your resume, it's gotta be up to snuff, regardless. You know, you've gotta have all your 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 materials in place. So if you're gonna list LinkedIn profile then really make sure your LinkedIn profile is, is updated. So if you're gonna give anybody any access to any of your work, just make sure it's all covered. That's all. It's a great- And point. sorry, Lisa, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, one thing I would think too, like if you, if sometimes there's a place in the application where you do actually put in your website. Right. And just make sure, you know, you've seen, you've seen websites where there's a, a, like a, a front page and then there's an index and then there's an index and then an index and it takes them a long time to get to what you want them to get to. So just make sure you're putting in someplace you want them to go. You actually do want them to go to your website, that you're getting them to the right page and that they're not having to take time to figure out where you want them to go because they won't. They'll, they'll be gone pretty quickly. Um, 
The other thing I was going to just say about websites is to keep in mind that if you're applying, you're an artist and you're applying to a grant that's not in the arts, so there's no portfolio pieces included, then they might be looking at your application and think, oh, this person is an artist, they do this kind of work, and I don't, I can't see it. They're going to go look you up for sure because they're going to want to see your work. So in that case, I think if you're applying to a grant where you cannot show your work, then they might be looking at your website. Yeah, and just to, one final note to add to what both Alan and Lisa said. Um, there may be, so it, it was a really good additional point where you can see a visual requirement, right? Which is 10 images. And then it, then there's a area and maybe it says optional for your website link. Um, if you put it in, and it's optional, again, very likely they're going to look at it. And anything that is asked for that you submit, um, to Alan's point, you want of the best quality. And to Lisa's point, you want to be able to navigate it and get through it well. So that part is really critical. Thank you. So we do have a couple more questions. We're doing real good here. So. Um, so Ariel asks, other than the speaker this Thursday, do you have any other recommendations for someone to talk to about tax advice? Um, so I know that there are like volunteer lawyer situations, but are there, are there similar in the, the accounting world? Um, the, um, well, one of the things in, in bringing up Hannah Cole, um, we are so, We've worked with Hannah a number of times who is presenting um, this Thursday. She is one of the best of the best um, in the field um, dealing with artists and designers. It is a case that many, um, you know, if your taxes aren't overly complex, many tax preparers, um, you know, will still work with you and will basically be dealing with the majority of the tax requirements. So as much as you might want a, you know, a tax accountant who's specific to the arts, um, any tax preparer, most tax preparers um, will handle the, the majority of work. It is great if you can find someone. A lot of this though is word of mouth, asking other people. Uh, I have to say in that word of mouth, again, we, we turn to Hannah a lot because she's so good. So I just really highly recommend um, you join us for the program on Thursday. Yeah, and you know, um, Ariel, I would recommend if you're check out the check out the session, um, and if you don't have time to sit through it on Thursday night, just register for it because you'll get the video. Right. You'll have ten days to view it, um, and you know, honestly, like if you are inspired by what's said, um, it's oh, it is a, it's definitely um, it is a free session. Yep, um, just to say. Um, but if you had questions for Hannah and you were in a unique situation that you wanted to explain, um, um, if you wanted to explain and ask Hannah, like, you, you know, explain your situation to Hannah. Um, and if she's unable to help you, she may be able to recommend somebody because she's in, in that network and she's, she's going to know other people. Um, and you know what, Ariel, I'm a little confused by your your other questions, because it's saying, Ariel's saying that it says that it's $15 to, to sign. Oh, oh, I see what you're doing. Um, you know what, go to the, go to the, um, the art of business link. Um, you know what, I'm going to put that in the chat one more time, Ariel. Um, sign up for the art of business session. That is free. That's free for everybody. Um, inside and outside the RISD community. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure I took care of, um, of this question fully, so. Yep, and just as a reminder, and Alan mentioned it, um, the volunteer lawyers for the arts, and they have chapters throughout the United States, including the Boston area, um, reaching out to them and asking for recommendations of accountants and tax preparers, um, they very often will um, potentially have a list since they are focused on legal issues in the arts. Um, yeah. So that may be one of your best bets. Um, we don't specifically recommend um, tax preparers and accountants. Um, that's why I think it's important to ask other artists and designers who they use um, and gain peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support that way. Yeah. 
And I just add, there also is the um, the state program, the the VITA Volunteer Income Tax Assistant Program in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and there's different. Um, Progresso Latino, Dorcas Place, a few other places. So I will put that in the chat also. Thank you, Lisa. Thank yep. you. You know, one of the reasons that I would at least listen in on Hannah's talk is because Hannah will um, give you some of the information. She's an artist and she's been right. working with artists this whole time. It's highly specific to the creative population. Um, and then you could take some of that information, even if you work with somebody else, you'll know the questions to ask. Right. Okay. Great advice. So um, Marcella asks, what are the chances as a certificate student candidate applying to residencies and or grants is as a seeking a new career at, at mid age? Um, what are the chances? Sorry, I'm, I'm forgive me. I'm, I, I may be mixing up this question a little bit. So, so what, so somebody that's making a career shift mid age, um, and, you know, CE alumni, I mean, we see RISD alumni, degree um, alumni as well, make shifts um, throughout their, their lives. Um, so what are the chances of getting, um, if you're moving into a different area um, mid, midlife, um, what are your chances of getting grants and residencies? Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, maybe start with you, Kevin. Yeah, I'm, you know, one of the things that's so critical in everything you heard tonight is that no matter what level you're at, um, no matter what program you're from, you have to meet the requirements of a grant application or residency application. So that's the first thing. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what level, what age, you've got to meet those requirements. Now, some of those requirements can be age requirements. For instance, many residencies will say you have to be 21 or older. So a student who's not 21 obviously can't apply. Regarding being at, a, you know, um, mid-career or, you know, at a point in your life when you're making a career shift, what's really important, I think, do you, are you loving your work? Do you believe in your work? Are you excited about your work? Because ultimately, the work you submit, you often have to talk about it as well. If you talk about how you've caught on to something that you're really passionate about, and how this grant or residency will help to give you the time, the space or the funding to do that, then you're gonna talk about it with a lot of enthusiasm and energy. You know, one of the things Lisa said is what makes you unique? What sets you apart? What are you passionate about? So you have to articulate that and also show it. That doesn't mean always that the work has to be, you know, at a level like why, you know, I'm getting solo exhibitions and, you know, of course I could get this grant. It, it's not that case. Um, you can be an emerging artist developing your work, but they really wanna hear why the, pro like Lisa said, why the program, what are you gonna get out of it? Why is it important? You know, those factors are just as critical as the things that you mentioned. So keep that in mind. That's the most important part. And but, you know, go ahead, Lisa, go ahead. I was gonna say there are some residency, residencies too that that not being in school or enrolled in a program can actually be a benefit right. because if you were in school then you have the resources so there are residencies that be like well, we don't, we're not funding current students because right. you have the resources so you might have an advantage as someone who is not currently in a program yep and also i'd like to amplify um so kevin used the the phrase emerging artist so, you know, Marcella, I don't know how old you are, I'm not asking, um, but you, you, if you are 60 and you are, you know, just embarking on this, this part of your life, you're still an emerging artist, even if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, whatever it is, you're an emerging artist. So look for those emerging artist opportunities. You get to self-identify that way. Um, so, and there'll be opportunities for you and they're going to, they're going to look at you regardless of your age. They're going to look at you as in that category of, of, of art, right. of, of, um, of, as an artist, not as a 60 year old or a 50 or a 40. So right. just to say, okay. Um, so we do, we've got it. One more question in. So it's a little after eight. So should we just make this the, the final question? Lisa. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. Good, good, great questions. So Shauna, 
I have a BFA and I'm currently a CE student. Um, does being part, part of a graduate or an MFA program make one more desirable to funders? So, and this is, you know, we should blow that out to everybody that's, you know, got an undergraduate degree and they're, you know, maybe even thinking about an MFA or some other form of higher education, you know, also continuing education, like whatever, whatever level you are, if you're entering the space as a, as with a BFA, um, let's speak to that. And Kevin, if you want to answer well, that. Actually, let me, Lisa was nodding a little bit, so let me hear Lisa's perspective and then I'll, I'll give you mine. Yeah. Sure, thanks. And the, of course there are there are grants that are, the eligibility is that you need to be currently in school. Um, a lot of the grants that schools are gonna offer are going to be for their current students, whether they're undergraduates or graduates. Um, so yeah, again, kind of the answer is it depends. And then I think obviously, when you've had more experience, sometimes you know more what you want to do. We all have experiences where we look back at the work we did two years ago, five years ago and go, ooh, because <laughs> um, we've learned and we've grown since then. So, you know, I don't think just stand alone. I mean, even Fulbright, who has some countries, have some of their programs that are, are more for master's degree programs or even PhD programs, but they're open programs. They are very careful to say, everybody's welcome, bachelor's degree and master's degree. And we will look at you slightly different because we don't expect someone at the bachelor's level to have the same, at least sort of educational experience to be at the same level as someone at a master's degree. Um, so they're an example of they're both in some ways excluding because they'll have master's degree grants and then they'll have bachelor's grants. So they might have some that are set for that, but then they also will have ones where they're trying to really make sure that they are looking at everybody at their own level. So yeah, I, I think it's, it depends on the grant. I think you really got to look at the eligibility and see what you're finding. Um, and I mean, obviously a grant isn't the reason to go to graduate school. So then once you're in graduate school, new things will open up to you. you Want to add anything? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. What's really, I, I just want to bring it back again, is how do you tell um, your personal story if, you, you know, again, you meet the requirements. So once again, if the requirements state quite resoundingly, you know, a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, you've got to meet those requirements. But there are many opportunities for which um, you could have a bachelor's that's not arts related. Um, and the question is, is that going to be view differently than if you came out of an arts background for an artist opportunity, right? And if, if anything, um, on that accord, I think there are more grant opportunities and residency opportunities that are looking for a broader range of education now than they were um, 5, 10, 15 years ago. And they're looking for more and more um, intersections of knowledge. So it's really exciting Again, if you can tell your story of development and why you're at this point in your life where you want this grant or this residency um, and you had a different background. You know, as Lisa said earlier, um, something that you might think is a negative um, is actually a positive if you tell that story. Um, so I really want to emphasize that, just like the previous question. Um, I think there's a lot of hopefulness to um, these applications if you can, again, tell that story. I would just add and maybe kind of on a final note that, you know, the whole, this whole thing, it's, it's not a scientific process. It's a human process. And there's so many humans involved from you to what you want to do, to who you're working with, to the reviewers. Um, so it, it's all about humans and making decisions and telling stories and making your case. Um, so jump in and make your case and ask for help, have people look at it, get a sense of how, how your work and your writing is coming across and work through it one step at a time and see what happens. Keep trying. Yeah, and, and to add to what Lisa just said, I, I, this is such a <laughs> cliche, um, uh, maybe way of saying this, but you know, a lot of this is like a scale, right? And and on this side, 
is this requirement, that requirement. Oh, good, you're tilting. And then maybe this part of your answer was a little weaker, so it tilts in this way. And ultimately, you're trying to tilt that, that scale. So all the parts that they're asking for, again, are, are, are you know, very often being all reviewed, those letters of recommendation. You know, like you could be, you know, being on a selection committee, oh, that proposal was good, the work is really strong, and then you read two killer um, recommendation letters, and then it tilts it again, you know? Um, so all of those parts play a really important role. Yeah. And, you know, this, this um, panel of people right now are kind of a good example of, like, what happens, because, yep. you know, Ke Kevin and I were giving conflicting answers earlier, because we do things differently. Right. So it just depends on who is on that jury that year. And that jury changes um, over, like it, many juries change from year to year to year. Um, the, the applicant pool certainly changes year to year to year. So you might be in a really strong um, competitive pool, um, not just numbers wise, but the, the strength of the work um, one year. And then maybe, you know, it's a little different um, the next time along and there are different jurors along the way. So like, I think that our, we are kind of like a little microcosm of like what does happen on a real jury that way. Yeah, and maybe, I know we're extending this, but it's, it's really insightful to when you're on the selection side. So here's one point, as artists and designers out there in the future, in the future, if you can ever um, get on a selection committee mm -hmm. or you're asked to be on one, mm -hmm. you will learn so much about the process. It's like mind blowing. So um, you'll hear this said often, if you can be on a committee, do it because you'll learn so much. But one of the other factors on a, on a committee is everything Ellen just said. So if you love um, a certain opportunity, a grant, and it is every year or residency, do apply multiple times, don't give up because you could just be in a different pool of people. There could be different jurors. Um, all three of us have seen this. We've all seen it happen. And those people who have persevered and applied multiple times have often got it. Um, so keep at it um, for sure. Yeah. Great note to end on there, Kevin. Great. Lisa, you want to take us out? Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Um, really appreciate it. Great questions. And yeah, go explore. Mm -hmm.